too. But let's start with prayer, okay? Father, we want to thank you for uh, allowing us to get together today, and we thank you, Lord, for a good Christian fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for your word that never changes. We just ask God for the anointing of your Holy Spirit as we teach today and as we listen and dig into your word, that we may uh, be very conscious of how the things of the world are changing, how your coming is soon, and we just pray your blessing over every aspect of this, this uh, meeting today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start in chapter 18, and in chapter 18 we learn uh, what well, we have learned already about who Babylon possibly is. We talked about some possibilities of, of Babylon, whether it be Rome or, or the Muslims or, or America, or uh, just a general spirit of, of uh, selfishness around the world, we talked about different things. There's uh, obviously a lot of different viewpoints as to what Babylon or who Babylon is. And uh, in chapter 18, we see an angel coming down from heaven crying, Babylon the great has fallen. And it mentions that all nations had drank of the wine of her fornication. So we see that there's both the moral and economical aspect of uh, Babylon. You could say both a religious and a political aspect as well. And a voice from heaven calls for the people of God. This is a part of this chapter that really stands out to me. Um, both men and especially now. It calls for the people of God to come out of Babylon, for God is remembering her iniquities. Babylon boasts that she sits as a queen and no widow. She won't see sorrow. She basically represents partying. But uh, we find out that her demise is in one day. And we find out no one will buy her merchandise anymore, but they'll stand at a distance for fear and, and, uh, and her torment and weeping. They'll be weeping and wailing. We find that shipmasters join the others in their mourning. Mighty angel takes a massive stone and hurls it down into the sea as an example of Babylon's demise. And her partying will cease. She will no longer be a city of lights and merriment. And uh, it's also found that she's responsible for the blood of God's people. All of that in chapter eight, 18. Excuse me. I was uh, thinking that this really uh, describes the condition of the rich, wealthy, and, and self-seeking people of the world who in uh, mass wealth to themselves and along with that have an attitude of not caring about anybody else. Um, this uh, Babylon is talked of as being a harlot, as being a woman that's immoral and unjust and and uh, it's almost like she has an island where there's total partying going on 24 hours a day. I don't know if that's going to be part of it or not, but uh, it, it seems that way. Today, Babylon is located in Iraq. You can fill that in on your papers there. It's, filled, it's in Iraq. Uh, a lot of people think that Babylon is going to be rebuilt. Um, I'm not sure myself. Uh, I think of, there's various scriptures that say that Babylon will, uh, will be ruined and will never be rebuilt again. But here in Revelations it says that Babylon is going to be destroyed. So either one of two things. Either the city of Babylon is going to be rebuilt, it's way off in the desert now, ruins there. Uh, either that's going to be rebuilt just to be destroyed in the tribulation period. Or Babylon refers more to a system or a, a number of rulers combined with a religious order. There seems to be quite a religious overtone to it, as well as persecution in the sense that there's a lot of, it mentions the blood of the saints there, blood of martyrs, that Babylon is directly responsible for. So uh, on one hand, she is self-seeking. Uh, living in total luxury, and we'll get into the, some of the things that are described there, which are awful. Uh, but on the other hand, she's responsible for the taking of lives of those who are going to worship and serve the Lord. So in Revelation, it, it tells us here that Babylon is going to be destroyed. That's the first thing. Is, uh, there was this angel coming down from, whoa, uh, Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. So the Antichrist is going to function out of three cities, I believe, Rome, Jerusalem, and Babylon. Depends on how you 
uh, would interpret that. It's interesting that Babylon is mentioned more times in the Bible than any other city except Jerusalem. It's interesting, isn't it? So Babylon is a prominent evil place. Uh, it speaks to those who try to do things on their own strength, and that attitude is still with us today. People trying to do things on their own strength. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe it was on Easter Sunday, that Pastor Aaron preached that day. Uh, the last time he preached, anyways, he talked about that in his message, how that today's culture, people try to solve their problems by themselves. My son called me up the other day, or actually, no, actually, I, uh, we called him because it was his birthday, and he, he told me, I, I heard just that uh, today's culture, they're trying to serve each other. That's really the way it is in the world. Where did I hear that? He says, oh, it was when I was at your church. <laughs> so I thought, right on. Uh, let's go to the book of Daniel, and just keep your thumbs in there in Revelation 18. And let's go down to Daniel chapter 4. If you get in the middle of your um, of the Old Testament or the middle of your Bible, you probably find Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, and just go a little bit further than Ezekiel, and you'll find Daniel, chapter number four, verses twenty nine and thirty. Daniel four twenty nine and thirty. I'll read those for you. At the end of the twelve months. He, that's King Nebuchadnezzar, was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. Note, note where he was. Okay, he's the king of Babylon. Verse 30, the king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? That really wraps up the attitude of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Who can remember what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar shortly thereafter? He became like a wild animal. He yes, yeah. like a wild beast out in the field, ate grass. Yes. Yeah, and his nails grew and his hair grew and he was covered with dew. Very good description, mm -hmm. yes. Oh. Sad, eh? Uh, and, and so we see that Nebuchadnezzar, even though he said he did this by his own strength, he made his own empire, he was the greatest sort of thing. That Daniel prophesied to him, said, no, it's, it's going to end. And uh, indeed, like you described, Helen, that's what happened to him. So that's what's going to happen to the Babylon in Revelation as well. Not that they're going to be out in the fields eating grass, but there's going to be destruction there. <laughs> This Babylonian doctrine, it's what we call today humanism. Okay, that's uh, one of the blanks on your sheet there. It is what we call humanism. Everything is about us. And what's good for me is the only thing that's important. We see that, we hear that day after day, even in the advertising on radio and TV, they're always after things that will make us feel good or just get through life a little easier. It's all about ourselves. So to, as Christians, we try to share the gospel of uh, giving our lives 100% for Jesus Christ. When I went to Bible school, that was very pre a predominant thought that, hey, we need to say yes to God, whatever he asks us to do, wherever he sends us. And uh, there was very much that that idea that we need to say yes to God. Today, uh, we talk to a lot of young people and young adults. That's a foreign concept to them. Is it any wonder that we have a hard time reaching people as a church when all of their life they've been brought up to look after themselves, to think for themselves? In fact, just recently somebody told me about that their children should grow up and uh, they were hoping that they would be able to decide for themselves the way that they should go. And I'm thinking, you know, that sounds so good, but it's so wrong according to the scripture. We're to teach our children the way of the Lord, to walk in the steps of the Lord. And if they do that, then good things will happen to them. God will look after them. But this whole idea of, you know, try this out, try this out, try this, and, and walk in all of the choices you can so that you can make up your own mind what's best for you. 
that is Babylon. And that is so evident in our, in our world today. Okay, so is Babylon is a real city? People think both ways. You mentioned that already. already. So uh, I'm not going to argue the point today. Um, you can believe whatever you, you feel that the scripture brings out the best there. Okay? There's a show on TV called Prophecy Today, and this guy, um, preacher, believes that New York City is a bad one. Yes, yeah, I, mean, I heard that too. Yeah. Preaching that. And there's some reason for that. I mean, it's a, the, the ship network of the world kind of thing. They have a huge port there, and it talks about shipmasters in Revelation. Yeah. So, okay. So either way, Babylon is saying that it represents a, a system of self. And note here the word fallen is a, uh, it says Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. I wondered why did it say it twice? Why didn't it just say, the angel just say Babylon has fallen? But uh, David Jeremiah, when I was listening to his commentary on that, he says it's because of a twofold destruction. There's a political part of that destruction, and there's a religious part of that destruction. And the Bible says here in Revelation 18 that it's going to happen in one hour. So it's going to happen really quick. Babylon is going to be kind of like Nebuchadnezzar, where, you know, I built this great empire, I built everything, it's, going to, it's self-seeking, I'm going to have this massive party, you know, live it up, but in one day it's going to come to an end. And uh, everybody that took part in that, both politically and economically, are going to stand off, it says, at a distance. And they're going to mourn because they're going to be greatly affected because there's no more Babylon. You can imagine the ships that were going up and down the Persian Gulf. At least I think that's where they go, uh, going through the, the locks. Uh, I think there's some channels there between there and the Mediterranean. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Suez Canal. Is that there? Yeah. yeah, that makes so. That's where the isn't that where the ship got stuck sideways? Stuck. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> that place. You can imagine ships going there, and uh, all of a sudden they see in the distance smoke coming up. Well, what's that smoke? Well, Babylon that they just built the great empire and the castles and all of the parties, the casinos and everything. It's burning, burning up. It's being totally destroyed, hundred percent, and the ship is full of objects and containers heading down the Suez Canal and heading to, towards Babylon. Not that Babylon's in the desert, but in that area. What are we going to do? All of a sudden their whole life is gone in a moment. All of the nations of the world are going to mourn. It's going to be a terrible time. So, it says it's going to happen in one hour. That's uh, in your notes there, okay? About the middle of the page. There's some reasons for the judgment of Babylon. First of all, because of her iniquity. She is so sinful that her sins have reached the heavens. The Bible says that there is, uh, it's because of her iniquity. God is now turning the tide on Babylon, and Babylon is being judged because of that. Secondly, it's a place of demons. In the Bible, birds are often used to describe demons. Um, I think sometimes in the Old Testament we talk about the haunt for owls and, and different ones. Uh, birds of prey come and, and they're, they're in Babylon because of the destruction. So a place of birds within specifically speaking of demons. Uh, number C, because of the blood of martyrs and the saints. Last verse uh, of chapter 18 uh, which says and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth on the outside it seemed like like Babylon was a beautiful place a place where everybody would love to go a place where you could go and have a good time but within that, there were murders and martyrdom of saints, people that had been taken conquest and, and, the, and their lives were taken from them. D, because of her influence, her, her influence was global. 
it says that the uh, the kings of the earth took place uh, took part excuse me in her wickedness and uh, the influence of materialism is still with us uh, the influence of that people that make choices behind the scenes uh, they tell me that there's a group of of uh, very wealthy people that really are the ones that control the economics of the world. Uh, I really do believe that. Uh, I guess some of the reasons I believe that is because I see the, the leaders of our nations, the kings of our nations, the presidents and prime ministers and so forth, making decisions that cause my head to shake because it's not their decisions. It's something that's happening behind the scenes. And uh, trying to think of the name that is given to this group of people. The Illuminati. The Illuminati, yes. The New World Order. Thank you. The New World Order. Yes. And we, we actually hear some of our leaders of countries use that phrase, the New World Order. They've been in contact with them. Things are happening. Because it's undercover, we don't know the details of what's happening. Um, it just baffles my mind how that the price of gasoline can go up and down and up and down. And it can be explained to me it's because of demand and, and uh, you know, across the world. Still doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Other things, uh, inflation and depression and different things happening around the world. Uh, economically, I'm not a great economic economist, but even to a simple mind like mine, I cannot yet uh, any understanding on why those things are happening. The shortages are controlled, there are human control and the shortages. The, so a lot of the United States farmers have been told if they don't take their crops off, they'll get paid for it. Yeah, isn't that crazy, eh? Yeah. And meanwhile, they're talking about ways to change the weather systems and control the environment, you know, and with the uh, cloud seeding, which they, they're doing already. And, uh, you know, who knows where it could go. Okay, number E, uh, because of her infidelity, she's smug with pride and sin, verse 7, and she glorified herself. Kind of reminds me of, uh, it says that in the, in these days, they will call good evil and evil good. And uh, that will be her, her mode of operation there. All of the wickedness that she does will be portrayed as goodness. And if the, uh, because of her inhumanity, verses 12 and 13, A is because of her iniquity, her sin. Yeah. Just uh, read verse 12 and 13 again. This talks about the merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of the most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Then, verse 13, it goes on, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, frankincense, excuse me, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep, horses and chariots. And did you notice what it added on to that verse 13? <laughs> the bodies and souls of people. Note that all of those other things listed there, none of them are the necessities of life. At least in verse 12. In verse 13 it goes on to say flour, wheat, and cattle, and sheep, but in, in verse 12, it's, it's all about wealth, it's all about show, the fragrances, the adornment, everything that makes her look good. But to tack that on at the end of verse 13 is basically saying that she is valuing the souls of men on the same plane 
as all of the others that are worthless. They're just objects. And here's another object, the souls of men. And that's, that's what it is to her. It doesn't consider them as being valued as a, as a soul that God created any such thing as a total foreign object uh, to her. The New American Standard seems to indicate slaves. The which? It says slaves. Slaves, the, yeah. yeah oh, yes, this, yes. Uh, one thing that we might be given a hint is we're instructed to come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and you might not receive her plagues. Now, if you were in Rome, or in a city, of, or in a New York setting, um, I think it's referring to worldwide, because it would be only certain people that would be instructed to come out. Um, so, it's, it's, I, I take that verse to mean more of a system, yes. a worldwide system. Yeah, I, I do too, in very much that a spiritual a, aspect, yeah. That might be a hint for us to consider. Well, I think the challenge is there for us in 2022, right here and now. Because I can, everybody in the world can come out of the system, but they, they can't just right. come out of one city or one place or one country. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's referring to a location there, is it? Yeah. Yeah. God says, come out and be separate. In other places, it says, come out and be separate, says the Lord, and I will accept you as sons and daughters. And uh, so it, it's a challenge for us to not be part of that whole system of luxury and self-seeking, lest we be like Babylon and come under the wrath of God <clears throat> that Babylon's going to come under. And we don't want to experience that. Any other comments about that? So the souls of men, just an object to be owned by her. It kind of reminds me of communism, where on the surface they, they would, the communist would tell you, oh, isn't it nice, everybody is equal, everybody gets the same. Um, there's a real push for that. But underneath that is this self-seeking attitude, um, where people are not, don't have any dignity of any kind, they're not valued. And so it's a constant suppression. Uh, you don't have people rewarded for their uh, diligence. Um, people can slack off and yeah, get the same. Everything's equal. Um, that, that's kind of the word communism is that. But it's going to be judged in one hour. Judgment is happening quickly. It's going to be complete. The word no more. This says about the sounds of merriment, the, the songs, the luxuries. Several times it mentions no more is there going to be any of that. And if you look through the scripture there, you'll see that. And here the judgment isn't like it was in other parts of Revelation where it was one third of the sea or one third of the waters. It's complete, 100%. Not a third, not a half. All will be gone. So it says the, uh, the kings will mourn, the merchants will wail, the craftsmen, those that are responsible for building stuff, they will weep, the bankers of gold and silver will mourn, the mariners, the, the shipmasters, they'll mourn. And I mentioned about what it would be like for somebody sailing their ship up the Persian Gulf at that time. Some have said that hell is a place where everything is there but can't be fulfilled. Only wanting, only wishing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the way it's going to be in hell, but I've heard that described that uh, if somebody goes to hell, they're going to get exactly what they wanted. That everything will be laid there, but as they reach out to grasp those things that they wanted, and, and uh, fill themselves in in luxury on earth, they'll only be able to reach out, to, but they'll never be able to enjoy any of the things that they see. I, I don't know if that's going to be the case in hell. We know it's a place of torment. It's no, we know it's a place of fire. And uh, we know it's eternal. 
<coughs> at least uh, when hell is thrown into the lake of fire, then it's eternal. <coughs> While this is happening, in verse 20, it says here that uh, this is what's happening up in heaven. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. We need to remember who owns us. We've got a good master. We don't have a deceptive master. We have a Lord God that before he left this earth said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We've got a master that's looking after us. And while this is going on in earth, we'll be in heaven singing the praises of God dancing around the throne forever and ever. There won't be any day or night there. We'll be worshiping and serving God. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful time. And when we hear about Babylon falling, it's not going to be with any sadness whatsoever. We're going to say, glory be to God. He is just God, and he's uh, avenged his adversaries. Okay, uh, we're going to go to chapter 19 and uh, see if we can get through this. In chapter 19, we see uh, more of the details of the victories of God in heaven. Uh, we're introduced to a term called the marriage supper of the Lamb. I love chapter 19 because we're finally getting to a place where there's some good news for the believer. Not just a little verse battered here and there, but uh, in going in detail here. We're told what our role is going to be in the final victories of God. It's exciting, folks. We're given an amazing description of Jesus riding on a white horse. We're told of the vastness and the thoroughness of Jesus' victory over his enemies on earth. And we're going to see how the beast and the false prophet are captured and thrown into the lake of fire. And so this is going to be good. So let's take the time and uh, read through this. So I'm going to go uh, verse by verse through this. And uh, we're now on the second sheet of paper handed out for chapter 19. So you can get your pens ready there. The harlot's judgment will be, circle one of those, A, B, or C. All of them? Well, what does verse 3 say? Annihilation is kind of like destroyed and, and never found again or never seen again. So you, it wouldn't be a slow torture. It's happening in one day, so it's, it's fairly quick. So I think it's letter C. Yeah. Verse 3 says that her smoke rises up forever and ever. So it's not just complete in the sense that she's gone done with, but it's complete in the sense that she's tortured in, in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Yeah, her smoke rises forever and ever. Then in, uh, uh, I just want to mention again in verse 2, it says, uh, for true and righteous are his judgments. That theme is is listed so many times in Revelation. And I think it's because some people would say, well, how can a loving God, you know, throw such judgments on earth? Well, he does that. In order to be a loving God, he's got to be a just God. And this time of wrath has come. He's throwing his judgments on earth, and he's totally uh, in his right to do that because he's God. He's not like man. He doesn't think like us. Uh, he's all loving, but he's all just as well. And... Uh, in verse 1 there, I just want to mention that I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. I, I was just kind of wondering about that, thinking about the church being raptured, and then we, as we went through Revelation, we found out that there was 144,000 of Israel that were first sealed, and they were caught up uh, into heaven. And then it talks about other martyrs that uh, in, during the tribulation had given their life uh, and they were up in heaven, the souls of them under the altar and so forth. 
And so I, what I was wondering is that great multitude, did it, did it grow over this course of time? Well, I think it did. But whichever way you look at it, there's a great multitude up there. Uh, I know how I feel when we get together um, for, well, I was thinking about the Good Friday service, especially when it was at the exhibition there at the field house. We had about 2,000 people or so all together. It, it, it's just something about a mass of people. So can you imagine in heaven people and people and people in a crowd cheering God, praising God, hand clapping, dancing, worshiping, bowing before him, just on and on and on. And the sound of that, just like a, the waves of the ocean, just wave after wave of praise to our God. Amazing. And uh, so in verse 5 there, it, well, verse, end of verse 4, it says that they're saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And then there's a voice from the throne that says, Praise our God, all you his servants. I, I don't think they even have to be prompted to praise. I think that praise is going to come very spontaneously. And then in verse 6, again, it says, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude. So who is that great multitude? Who do you think that multitude is? I gave you some ideas, but is there any thoughts that you might have about that? Saints of God. Saints of God. Okay. Well, the angels will be there too. The angels will be there too, yeah. yeah. The elders. And the elders. Sure is, yeah. The martyrs. Okay, there's a word there in at least my translation that says, Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. That's the end of verse 6. What does that word omnipotent mean? Uh, no. Close. All powerful. Yes. All powerful. Omniscient is all knowing. So omnipotent is all powerful. This is the place in Revelation where God's immense power is being poured out. His wrath is being poured out on earth. And everybody is seeing now the, the mighty hand of God's power of judgment. Okay, the next one is uh, who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Verse 8. Describe the bridegroom there, or excuse me, uh, the bride, isn't it? The bride. Yeah. How how is the bride described there? Verse eight. Righteous. Righteous. Yes. I guess that's what I heard. And white robes. White robes. Fine linen. Fine linen. Yeah. White, clean and bright, it says in my translation. Any other translations they have a different description there? And what does it say that the, uh, the fine linen, clean and bright is for the... represents the good deeds. Yeah, mine says the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So when we say that we are clothed with white or with fine linen, we are clothing ourselves with the acts of righteousness, God within us. Our, our righteousness in ourselves, I know that that's like filthy rags, but God's righteousness radiating out of our lives is like fine linen. And that's a, it's an apparel, it's, it's a covering for us. And uh, so when we are ushered into the gates of glory, we will be given robes and they're gonna be linen, bright, clean robes without spot or wrinkle. Okay, so on your sheet there, who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? It's those who are arrayed in fine linen. 
or you can put those who are righteous, I guess. I want to just back up there for a bit. In verse 7, it says that the marriage, the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. It's kind of interesting if we, uh, we, we don't know that much about that because in, in our culture, on the wedding day, the, the focus of all, the, all of the attention is the bride. She's the one wearing the white gown. She's the one that marches up the aisle with her father. She's the one that uh, is the center of attention. The guy there, he just kind of stands off to the side and, yeah, I do, I do, I do. He's getting in practice. <laughs> but really, the wedding, in the way we know it, doesn't have a whole lot to do with the guy. It's to do with the bride. She's getting ready months ahead of time, going to pick out that favorite dress. She wants everything to be uh, just so at the wedding ceremony and at the reception, everything has to be just the way she wants it. But you know, it's, it's not that way in Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, the groom was very much the center of attention. And in uh, Oriental marriage, uh, he would be, well, the bride would take second place to the bridegroom, and, and so it is with second place to the bridegroom, Jesus. We, the bride, take second place to him. He is the focus of attention. There's a sacred wedding in, in Jewish custom. The man comes to the house, he claims his bride, listen, and then he returns to his house. Does that sound like what Jesus is saying here, what he's going to do with his bride? He's going to come to earth, he's going to claim his bride, the believers, he's going to take them back to his house in heaven. Wow. We're going to meet him in the air. He's going to take us personally to his father's house as he promised us. Now, the relationship of the bride to the bridegroom up, up to this time is one of engagement. Only after the wedding ceremony, when the bridegroom comes to take the bride to the house, that's when the marriage is consummated. In the same sense, we are the bride of Christ in a future sense. We are engaged to him in a very literal sense right now. Yes, we belong to him. We are his bride. But at this time, let's just uh, look at a verse here. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Could somebody look that up and read it? I have betrothed you. That's engagement. Yeah. yeah. So that's what Paul is really saying there. We are engaged to Jesus. Okay? And when the marriage supper comes, we will finally will be brought to the house. I don't know exactly what that's going to be like. I think that there, I mean, now we, we have God's spirit living within us. But when we see him face to face and we are there in his presence, there's going to be something spiritually supernatural takes place that, that we're going to be as one. We're going to know Jesus like we never knew before in completeness. Now we see through a glass darkly, then we will see face to face, right? And uh, it's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll be invited to come. Um, Again, listening to Dave Jeremiah, he distinguishes between, uh, oh, what is it, the, the, the marriage, the actual marriage of the Lamb and the Supper of the Lamb, says they're two different things. Uh, I don't know, I, I couldn't quite get my head wrapped around that, but maybe, uh, maybe you can, I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, uh, where did I, what verse was I in? Oh, yes. So in verse 10, oh, by the way, verse 9 says, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Verse 10, I fell at his feet to worship him. This is the person that's, that's talking to John, right? Whether it be an angel or uh, another saint. Uh, he says, see that you do it not. Don't do that. I am your fellow servant of, of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So some, it kind of indicates that this is uh, another believer that's gone on to be with the Lord in heaven. God sent him back down to describe some of these things to John. It, it could be an angel, I don't know, but it does say that I'm of your brethren. So, And he says, don't worship me, worship God. And then there's this strange phrase in there, right? For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I thought, how in the world? What, is, what does that mean? And uh, I don't even know if I've got this right, but uh, as I studied it a little bit, I think when it's talking about the prophecy there, it's not talking about prophecy in the church or uh, tongues and interpretation or anything like that. I think what it's talking about is the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation. And it's this, this book is the revelation of Jesus. So in other words, it's the testimony about Jesus. The whole central focus is Jesus. So I think what it's saying is that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The whole spirit of this book is to lift up Jesus. So I, I don't know. Again, that's, that's my idea, the way I looked at that. So. You would agree with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, in verse 12, it says, His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on it that no one knew except himself. So here's Jesus on a white horse. Verse 11 says, They have an open, and behold, a white horse. Can you remember back in chapter 6, we talked about four horses, the white, the red, the black, and the pale. Um, the pale was kind of an ugly green color or something. But anyways, now we have another white horse. And we said at that time that the white horse in chapter 6 was not Jesus. Do you remember the differences between that white horse and this white horse? Throw some things back to me here. Who was riding on them? Who was riding on them? Yeah, in... Uh, here it tells us who's riding on it in verse 13 and on, right? Clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's pretty significant. Okay, we know it's Jesus. What about in, in chapter 6? Satan. 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 And uh, so the idea there is that the person riding that white horse was going out in appearance like Jesus, but not. He was going out in peace, but not. He was actually going out to conquer, and he was deceptive. Um, I think, uh, does it say he, what, what he wore in chapter 6? Uh, Akron. He had Akron. And in chapter 19, many crowns, yes. Yeah. In uh, chapter 6, he that sat on it had a bow. Chapter 19. Okay, that's chapter 6. A crown, a crown was given to him. Yeah. And in chapter 19, he has many crowns. Yeah, a good point. Uh, later on here, it says that he, uh, out of his, verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. So his weapon is his word. Um, when, when Jesus was involved in creation, the Bible says that let us make man in our image and so forth, this plur, plural, plural, excuse me. We see God as God the Father is the great mastermind of creation. We see Jesus as the word of God, the spoken word of God, and God said. And here in Revelation it says out of his mouth comes a great sword. It's the word that he speaks going to overcome the enemy by he won't even have to draw a sword out of his sheath just by his word the enemy will fall Pauline and I were reading in our devotions this morning, I, I got to quit here but anyways, uh, about how the Lord rescued Israel 
Um, I forget the name of the king, Joshaphat, yeah. Joshaphat went out and says, the army is too great for us, oh God, and he inquired of the Lord, what will we do? God says, go out and stand behind the mulberry bush and wait for the sound of uh, the marching in the treetops. And when you do, go out. And as they went out, they looked, and all they saw in the valley, dead bodies everywhere. <laughs> God said, you won't have to fight this. And the uh, interesting thing in Revelation, it says, not only is Jesus on a white horse wearing many crowns, who is following him? We are on white horses. I thought, that my first thought was this, you know, I'd love to bring a horse to, to Coffee Row on Wednesday <laughs> and bring him in here. And has anybody ridden a white horse? I haven't. Way to go, way to go. <laughs> That would be so cool to just sit on a white horse and say, this is going to be me in a few years. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I'd love to do that, but uh, I think the church uh, pastor the might general. have something to say about that. <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to mention, oh, um, verse 14. There's several... Times, I think a couple times here that it mentions about the armies the armies of the Lord right the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him in white horse so if that's us we are armies of the Lord we're going to partake in that warfare we probably won't have to do anything because Jesus is at the head and as he speaks the enemy is destroyed but uh, I, I just want to challenge you on that point that our walk with the Lord is not a walk of roses. It's, it's a battle. We're under constant barrage of the devil yet. We have to fight. We have to be vigilant. We know the devil goes around roaring like a lion. And so we, we face him. We face him through trials, temptations, discouragements attitudes and things that maybe we take with us from past experiences. Satan knows what those are because he observes us in what we do. Sometimes we even give the devil a foothold. The Bible tells us don't give the Satan a foothold because he'll take advantage of them. But sometimes we do that and then we have to confess our sin. Thank God he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we will be part of the armies of God. There will be a day coming when we will be part of the victory, the grand finale. Okay, I'm going to try to wrap this up. Uh, how many more blanks you got here? Three. Oh. Where am I? Three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I know where I am. Um, Oh, verse 17, flip down to verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. So the question on your sheet there is, who's invited to the supper of the great God? Now be careful. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a slight difference in the name. You have this, the marriage supper of the Lamb, here you've got the supper of the great God, which is totally different. Birds of prey. The birds of prey are invited to the great the supper of the great God. And the overthrow of of all of the enemies that have come together in mass to try to fight against God. So, so that you may eat of the flesh of kings and flesh of captains, so forth. Where were the beast and false prophet cast? Okay, what verse is that? Verse 20, yes. The two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Anyone know what brimstone refers to? Burning sulfur. Yes, synonymous with burning sulfur. It uh, evokes an acrid odor. If you've ever been around sulfur burning, it just mm -hmm. kind of gets you right in, in your sinus, I guess. Imagine that day after day, eh? No, don't want to be there. And then verse 21, the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him that sat on the horse, 
and all the birds will fill, were filled with their flesh. I'd like to close this session by just looking at a couple more verses, uh, three in fact. Uh, first of all, could somebody look up Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4, and another person look up Matthew 24, verses 27 to 31, and a third person look up 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 to 10. Matthew? Matthew was 24 verses 27 to 31. Okay, can somebody read Zechariah if you have Zechariah 14 verses 3 and 4? Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Okay, so it says the Lord will uh, does say descend or what does it say go uh, for it? says his people stand on No, the before that? Olives. Oh, and he fights in the day of battle. Uh, and the Mount of Olives shall split. No, two. before that. You know. <laughs> it just says, <laughs> well, wait, okay, the Lord will go forth against. Uh, no, no, no. Yes, that's that's what I was looking for. Oh, that's a. The yeah. Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. Fight against, yeah. So that is uh, synonymous with Revelation, talking about Jesus coming on the white horse yeah. with us following. Yeah. Okay, and it's an innumerable company that's following with Jesus coming to fight against the enemies on earth. Mm -hmm. Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4. And uh, now Matthew 24, 27 to 31. For as the lightning flashes in the east and, shine, and shines in the west, so it'll be when the Son of Man comes. Just as a gathering of vultures shows that there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of these days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the power of the heavens will be shaken. And then at last the sign of the Son of Man coming, it, the Son of Man is coming, will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. That's and right. they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. With power and great glory. So I think the first few verses probably is referring to the rapture um, coming quickly and this, the latter part of that coming in the clouds and he's coming for warfare against his enemies. Um, we'll leave that for now and let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 to 10. 